so we are live in 5 4 3 2 1 we are live now a very good evening to all of you thank you so much for being with us here today we are going to have a very exciting uh, session on spondylolisthesis it's a day to day practice scenario and uh, we have a whole gamut of uh, treatment modalities right from conservative to conventional to minimal invasive so we'll be going through uh, all those uh, modalities through our case discussions we'll try to cover as much as we can but before i start i would like to invite dr satyan mehta who is the secretary of the bombay orthopedic bombay spine society to uh, uh, say a word before we can start thank you thank you agnivesh uh, uh, on behalf of bombay spine society i uh, thank all of you for joining us uh, we have our uh, sessions uh, almost every month uh, and uh, we will be uh, sharing these on ortho tv as well so that for the benefit of everyone uh, at the end of the meeting i'd also uh, request everyone to have a look at the brochure of uh, the bombay spine society annual conference which is being held in october <clears throat> Uh, it is a very uh, good conference with live surgery demonstration of spot spine along with uh, uh, three different types of cadaver workshops including mis uh, in and uh, cervical spine uh, problems and basic spine uh, uh, surgical techniques we also have two uh, day school uh, camps on uh, on spine tumors and one which i am very excited about on uh, um, Uh, scoliosis surgeries uh, which will be done by dr nene uh, dr nene is an expert at this and has a, uh, has a one week program for training these but he is doing a one day program for training us in uh, scoliosis surgeries so have a look at this uh, please uh, uh, also try and register for this uh, meeting and uh, we look forward to welcoming you in bombay for this uh, over to agnivesh uh, dr agnivesh is our eminent spine surgeon here in uh, bombay in apollo hospital and he will be uh, moderating this session on uh, spondylolisthesis and it will be morely case mostly case based presentation over to you agnish thank you so much dr satyan so i would like to uh, start with the first uh, talk of the evening and then we will have the case discussion session so for that i would like to request dr vishal peshetiwar to share his screen dr vishal peshetiwar is a senior spine surgeon from kokila ben hospital he is a expert in mis and he is going to show us a demo of mis relief over to you dr vishal Hi, good evening. Uh, so uh, this is a video of uh, grade two going to three lysis. Uh, primarily, uh, spondylolysis is the slip uh, between two vertebrae, most commonly seen in L five S one in women and L four five in men. Uh, this is a high grade lysis that you can see here, uh, which we uh, treated about. Uh, Eight years back, using uh, Indian implants. This is uh, the post-op uh, picture, and uh, that's the CT scan showing a good grade uh, one Bridwell union there. So these are some of the cases you can do it without navigation using uh, the traditional MIS method, or you can use it uh, doing a. a, a 2D or a 3D navigation. A couple of things that you would want to uh, remember is if it's at the L5 S1 level. So unless you get this corner here for your S1 screw, if your S1 screw is short and not getting the opposite cord, it's not a tricord screw. The chances that this will fail are very high. So if you can see, this is a very long screw that is parking right at the tricord. So you should take an effort to put in a link case, break the opposite cortex, may, uh, tap it right up to there, and then put the screw so that you get a good purchase there. so this is the one that we started doing with 2d navigation this is very uh, early 2015 onwards and then of course now we use the o arm which is a 3d navigator so you get the advantage being that you can see it in all three planes you can put in an exact uh, length of screw uh, and uh, the purchase being much much better so uh, one of the things you should remember in spondylolisthesis is a lot of uh, 
uh, importance, at least in my training, was given on reduction on screws. Uh, screws in the spine are usually uh, cancellous holding in that uh, S1 and uh, pedicle purchases 60% in L5, which is one of the weakest pedicles to get a hold on. So if you're going to load your screws, screws are torque neutralizing in the spine construct. It is the front that is the intradiscal space, which is weight bearing. So you should use, the, these are cheap, uh, made in India, uh, puka chisels to jack up the disc space. Because as you restore the anatomy, the stress on the screws goes down and you are able to get a better reduction and you're able to have, a, uh, your construct has a fighting chance to survive why well uh, the whole logic goes that if you have a aesthetic segment like this assume this is the disc space where the top vertebra has slipped on this thing so when you jack this up <clears throat> this structures the all the pll and the annulus which is crumpled over starts tensing over it's like doing a ligament rotrexis of a distal and radius in a ligament rotrexis you use the ligaments around the wrist to uh, hold your reduction by putting it under tension so this is what you're doing as you jack up this soft tissues which have crumpled start tensing up and as they open up you get the restoration of height and then you have to put in an adequate size cage to hold this so this soft tissue tension and the cage in between gives you a stable construct so when you put in the screws, they are talk neutralizing and not load bearing or load sharing. So the chances of the implant failing in this case is less. If you have understood this concept, the chances of your listesis surgery going very uh, safely is okay. This case, which I'm showing is something we did about uh, six, uh, I think uh, six months back, 60 year old lady reduced to walking a few meters, a very stiff grade two listesis here, as you can see. Uh, this is the video. We usually use a Jackson table at our place. The advantage being uh, it is carbon fiber, so there are no artifacts. So at the four pads, this is a, she was fairly robust, close to 90 odd kgs, very short. That's the position. They're not reducing on the lateral. Some of the tricks to make it parallel is to get a head high uh, so that the end plate can be seen as a very small smile of an end plate you can see you got to mark it on the skin so that you know where you're going to go your skin surface i'm doing a standard technique uh, mis i use a thompson tube what i'm using is a dilator to go down the first dilator docks on the facet joint and this is a subsequent serial dilators you check for the length of the tube that you're going to use just move it like a periosteum so that you get uh, the soft tissue off the bone uh, there and the facet joint uh, you can use any of the local, we have done it with Indian tubes from Pitker and Jesco. You can use a Metronic tube. I use a Thompson because I think this is more robust. Uh, everybody has his own choice so, uh, to use this. So you say, uh, once this is done, always remember to take a check shoot to see that you are at the correct place. Here we are docked at the correct place. This We use a Zeiss Pantero 900i uh, because neurosurgery also shares this. You can see the vision is very, very clear here. You can see this is the head end, that's the medial, that's the inferior, and that's the lateral. I'm using a chisel to cut the bars here. Uh, that's the facet joint and you can see the picture in picture this is what i'm doing and that's what is uh, happening inside the microscope uh, the advantage of using a microscope is you get a very clear magnified view that's the facet you can use a chisel a uh, kerosene rounder you can use a less scale to get there but a chisel gives you a very clear straight cut and once you learn to control it it is one of the best uh, devices you can use for uh, opening up the canal, you of course need to take care of some of the spicules that might be remaining to get a smooth finish. Once you've done that, you need to expose the tip of the superior facet because if you have not done that, excising this becomes a problem. This is a very osteoporotic lady, so we chose to use a less scale rather than a chisel, which can go into a pedicle and cause you grief in getting a good purchase. So the rest of the part, this is what you are exposing is the cambium strangle. Now. Uh, Taking this also gives you decent quality bone graft. If there is a severe central stenosis at this stage, you would first do over the top decompression and then do your um, uh, T lift. Here it wasn't much of a central stenosis, more of a lateral lesis. So I'm doing just the decompression on the ipsilateral side. I've used wax to uh, stop the venous bleed from the bone here. You should do that only after you harvested the graft. Always be careful while separating the flavum from the dural sac here. Please use a ballpoint blunt probe uh, to, uh, to go through and release or feel for any adhesions and use a very sharp curate to uh, sharp kerosene 
to basically take care of the ligamentum flavum. Uh, over a period of time, you'll find that there are a lot of additions that have developed. That's the number 15 uh, blade I'm using to get into the disc space. It can barely make that cut. Uh, it can't go inside with it's very, very small. So once this cut is ma uh, made, you have access to the disc space. Uh, this you will need uh, to just put in, this is number four pen field to get me the orientation. I can barely put it inside. That is how narrow it is. You need to then at this stage, uh, I'm, this is a six millimeter wide and 2.5 millimeter thick puka chisel. Uh, not going in. So I'm using a two number kerosene rounder to get some of the end plate off, putting a 3-0 uh, lumbar curate there to just make some space. This is a surgery that requires a lot of patience. If you're not a patient surgeon, spine surgery is a wrong branch for you. Using several small 3-0 curates at various angles, we are here now able to make some progress. I'm able to put in my two millimeter pituitary inside to pick up whatever disk space is there. Now the pen field is going in better. I'm also getting an idea of the orientation of the end plates. Then again, using a curate to work and make some more space. Once you have that little space to go in, is the time for the puka chisel to come in. You have to bury it through inside because if you just put half of it inside, it's going to fracture your end plate. Just gently open it up so it opens up six millimeters, which is good enough for you to then put in more larger curates to take the uh, cartilaginous end plate out. This is a small ring uh, curate that I'm using. This is if you use Indian, Jesco makes this, and this is a green handled one. Once that is in, now you can see in picture in picture what I'm doing. I'm rotating, I'm putting the narrow end in and then rotating, jacking it up like you would raise a car. And once you put it in, you leave it inside for some time so that the tissue gets a chance to stretch and there is no sudden uh, distraction there. It can cause hypertension, it can cause injuries to calcified vessels in the front. So this is something that needs to be done. This is a very important step. As we serially dilate, this is an eight number which I'm opening. So once that give is given, then the subsequent dilatation should be good enough. You leave your puka inside for some time. Let the chisel uh, open it up. It's a chisel, but it's a blunt chisel. Remember that uh, you should have a set handy. Uh, serial dilators still, I think we dilated this till 12 millimeters, uh, jacked it up to 12 millimeters. So leaving it in for some more time. So. This step allows the tissues to stretch. The ligaments that are stretching have a uh, pulling effect on the superior vertebra. So you get a translation as you keep stretching it of the uh, vertebra that has been uh, that has uh, subluxated forward. So this is the last chisel we'll be putting in. This I think a 12 millimeter, and that's the dilatation. You leave the last one inside. You can see I can just about uh, push it. So this is a good size to uh, stop at because you don't want to overdo it because if metal will eventually rip through whatever tissue is there inside. So just right is what you are looking for. You will encounter some bleeding at this stage because a lot of epidurals open up which have been dormant inside and been pressed for this time. So be prepared for that. Uh, most of it will usually go inside the disc. This is the time now to put in your curious to the opposite side because the end point of a tea leaf is fusion. So unless you have made adequate preparations of the end plates and the bony end plates are open, you're not going to get a fusion. So however, uh, and whatever uh, implants you put in will eventually fail. So a good end plate preparation is where you should spend time on. You should have a nice uh, surface at both ends, which has pinpoint bleedings. You should not take the bony end plate out because that will lead to a lot of problems. That is the bone graft funnel. Use a bone graft funnel to put your graft inside so that it doesn't, that doesn't wander into the spinal canal because retrieving it through a minimal access incision is going to be a challenge. So that's the bone graft going in. Put in adequate bone graft. This is what will unite the two surfaces. Remember, you're trying to unite a surface where nature meant there to be mobility. So you need to be very thorough in what you're doing. So once you have done it, tamp it and use a trial. Always use a trial so that your softer peak cage will have a way to go and will not have to fight any resistance. And of course, you will know what is the exact size of the cage that will go in. I think this is a 12 or a 14. I'm not sure of the size anymore. You will encounter some bleeding. So pack it up with, uh, I rarely use uh, patty, but this is some one of the cases where you would want to uh, put in a patty till your final cage is gone in and then you get your hemostasis sorted. 
So let this trial remain for some time so that this, it also helps in stretching the soft tissues there. Once that is done, you put in a final cage. I prefer to use bullet cages, uh, local make. Again, uh, Jesco makes excellent of this. This I think is a 12 or 14 number bullet, 24 uh, or 22 millimeters in length. There are two options available. Uh, this nerve root retractor is 10 millimeters. So I think this is about 14 millimeter cage that is going in. It has to be a good size cage. If you are putting anything below 12, you're probably undersizing your cages because there is no disk space which is of that 10 millimeters or eight millimeter size. So put in adequate size cages, ensure that the posterior most part of the cage has crossed the posterior most part of the vertebral body. Once that is done, you just go and do over the top uh, decompression. This is how clearly you can see. That's the beauty of using a microscope. This is clear 3D vision. What you're seeing is a uh, film that is not full HD, but actually what you see is true color. You, this is the opposite side. You can see how beautifully it's got decompressed just by uh, restoring the height. I can actually move my ballpoint through a 180 degree spin and is going in without any effect. So I'll stop at this stage because next is implantation, which I think everybody can We use an OAM. You can use a normal uh, navigation or something. This is what we got at the end of it. This is a fair restoration of the height. Uh, I use Lodos rod so that to uh, give in that kick in a little more Lodosis and restoration of the sagittal balance. So these are some of the work. You can do it at multiple uh, levels also. This is a two-level listesis, one of our colleague's mother. This is what we did for her. She is now nearly five uh, months post-op doing well. Uh, well, this is the case where we started prospective documentation. This is more than five and a half years old, 75-year-old, high-grade listesis. That's her setting one month later on the floor and squatting. So a lot of people say, oh, why do you make your patients squat? The implants will walk out. you got to put in your implants properly. You need to do your uh, restorations properly. The implants will hold. You don't do it well. They're going to walk out even if your patient is lying on bed for three months after that. This is some of the papers we have published. That's the end point, a classic Bridwell grade one union that you see. And this are some of the cases that we have done. All of them have so far the, gone to union. The first case was done by me and Devesh uh, in our series in 2011. It's been more than uh, 11 years plus now. We've I've crossed close to 100 in Ambani Hospital. We have a prospective follow-up of nearly uh, eight, 70 to 80 cases that we have done. It's a good procedure to do in uh, any listesis or any spine surgery to do a minimal access one. Because the whole idea is to have the smallest footprint of normal tissue damage while operating. The blood loss is much less. The vision is as good as it gets. You cannot see this when you're doing an open surgery unless you're using a microscope at a very odd angle. Uh, the screw placement is very accurate. The recovery is much faster. The implant failure rates in, uh, have been very, very low. Yes, initial part, it will be a little long operative time. The learning curve for this is after you've finished at least 100 odd normal lysis fusion. You shouldn't be going into uh, lysis cases immediately. Uh, I can say now we have long-term 10 plus year results of about four to five cases. We have 30 cases which have more than five year result. And in the past five years, we've done another 60 odd cases. And so far, so good, we've been lucky. None of them have cages walking out or none of them have had a deficit or something that we have had to face. So that's the case. I think uh, at this point, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, this it should be open to discussion. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Vishal, for this excellent uh, demonstration. And uh, I believe you can you cannot see it better than the microscope. With naked eye, you can still do the procedure with the headlight. But again, the microscope is one of the best things that will help your surgery improve the patient safety and outcomes. Uh, if uh, are there any questions from the other panelists, or we can proceed to case discussion. So maybe I'd like to ask Vishal uh, Nivesh with your permission. Uh, so, in, a, in a high grade spondy, like a dysplastic high grade, you know, like not a degen where uh, you may want to reduce before putting a cage. What's your uh, strategy then in an MIS? So uh, in a dysplastic, it's a completely different uh, 
case scenario. So if it is very stiff, yes, you should, uh, it will take, uh, I mean, grade four and five dysplastic would probably not be a good thing to do minimal access. However, what you can do is put a delta screw if you're not planning a reduction. But if it is reducible, what happens is you just take the tip of the sacrum and knock it off with a bent chisel. That's what my boss used to do when he used to do it even open. You can do that with an MIS. You just have to dock two tubes through both the tubes. You can just knock the front of the sacrum to release it. Or you can just release the anterior attachment uh, of uh, the annulus on the sacrum and see if you can reduce. If you can't reduce, then it's something that's not done. Unfortunately, we haven't seen many dysplastics. The only ones we saw were grade three, which are easily reducible. But majority of Indian patients produce, I think, uh, uh, come to uh, you at a higher grade. In those cases, our experience is lacking. So lastly, yeah. you would say that if reduction is needed, uh, the strategy would be inverted, like you put in screws and reduce and then put the cage and is that still good for MIS? Uh, so my take is if you are using screws to reduce, you're putting the stress on the screws. This is something that would uh, increase your chances of failure. So if you are going to jack up the height and reduce it, what is see, the front of the spine, the middle and the anterior column is the weight bearing column. The posterior column is where the torque is neutralized. So you have facet joints which actually prevent uh, the from having a rotatory movement. So when you put in screws, the essentially screws are do giving you stability. They are not weight bearing. They are just there to neutralize the torque and give you a stable environment. The weight bearing part has to be in the front. This is a tension surface, this is an orthopedic principle. So if you are expecting your tension surface implants to do the job for the front, you're looking for a failure. So you put in at four, then you use the screw to reduce L5. So if you can reduce by using a screw at four and S1, and then you're uh, using a reduction screw to L5, this is something which is eminently reducible by just doing the intradiscal release. So at a time when intradiscal release was not okay, where cages were a little primitive, it was okay. In today's time, even in open surgery, if you're going, in fact, in open surgery, you can actually do bilateral facetectomy and do a uh, jack up from one side and put a cage from the other side. That would be even better to just do one level. Why involve the other level, the dissection and all? I don't see any reason. No, no, that I think you missed my question, Vishal. My question was, if you have a high grade spondy, would you still go with putting a cage before putting the screws? Always, always. That's what I'm trying to say. I was trying to tell you my philosophy. I don't believe in letting the screws do the reduction. I'm talking only about degenerative. I'm not no, no, a high grade spondy which you need to manipulate to reduce. I mean, that's the case scenario. So, if it is not something that can be done by a release, it should not be done MIS. Then you do a proper open one, take your ILAC purchases, and then use your L5 as this thing. But majority of the times, the L5 screw gets messed up. Okay, I get your point. Uh, you shared something to say. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so uh, just uh, I completely agree with what Dr. Vishal told. And to add to that, even uh, this, uh, the, this, this plastic ones, we have done one grade four and two grade three with MIS. And the, uh, and the trick is to go bilateral. So you need to put two tubes, as he was saying. So you need to release that. The whole thing is two things are important if you're doing those. First is your dome osteotomy because you won't be able to get in without that. So S1 dome osteotomy is the key. And then you need to go bilateral with two tubes one tube on the each side and start releasing them. And then like the way he did, we did what we did for those cases where we used two, uh, the, the pukas on both the sides. So you go like paddle from one side one and then, and then you gradually lift up the whole thing. And then uh, the, again, the key and what he told and I agree, again, completely agree is to get the height back. If you get the height back, it reduces. Maybe for the last part, maybe for last grade, you can use the screw and then we use a all deduction MIS screws, which, which comes with uh, some of the companies. What they make is the, the whole tower is a reduction tower. You can slightly correct your angle better, but the key again remains you can do at least almost 95% of the MIS, but you need to get the height back before you do anything. And that is how the thing works. And the same concept is used by the NTA surgeon. If you see them, or when those who guys who do a lift and every, or o lift so they do what they do is just get the height back and the whole thing reduces the so same concept you can apply from posterior and achieve this similar result right uh, thank you dr ayush thank you nene sir uh, so we'll move to the case discussion part
for that we have uh, eminent faculty we have dr abhay nene very senior spine surgeon one of the pioneers in his field from uh, leelavati hinduja khar hospital we have uh, dr ranjit unni krishnan who is joining us from trivandrum he is a very senior spine surgeon from trivandrum and one of the uh, key faculty in all our conferences a very close friend we have uh, dr ayush sharma a senior spine surgeon from mumbai and we have dr manish kothari senior spine surgeon from jaslok hospital of course i'll request dr vishal pishetiwa to stay back for his expert comments and dr satyan to contribute also so uh, nene sir can we begin with your case please yeah okay it's a bit odd ball but i'll uh, still begin with uh, the case odd ball because uh, if you see the presentation uh, you all can see what this is you know it's like a regular ais case so uh, any immediate thoughts anybody it's a young girl who has recently noticed a scoliosis uh, tipping over and uh, then that's the x rays those are the bending films mm. open forum one one uh, one clinical catch points or seems the adams test which you have very uh, clearly shown in the picture so you can get, getting correct at the moment yes, yes. that's what he said it's uh, something which is more of a it's a, it's like a there's something book. which is leading to the scoliosis just yes. take it's a uh, it's a take it's a textbook picture so <laughs> <laughs> so can you uh, can you uh, you know elaborate on what you saw in the adams test so uh, uh, basically uh, adams test is to differentiate between a structural and a postural scoliosis so as you bend forward you see the curve uh, uh, in the first picture which is there and you see it disappearing uh, side by side whenever you are uh, sort of uh, uh, when the patient is bending forward so whenever this is happening so you can see the patient sort of uh, the hump going away so this is the adams test it is see this and see there is no hump over here when the patient is bending forward so this is the classical adams test to uh, sort of uh, distinguish the postural from structural scoliosis lovely so i think that's a lovely uh, point uh, you know take take home point the other thing that you probably want to look at is uh, you know that fullness over here that you see which is again not so common uh you can see that there is a significant truncal shift but not much rotation so all this kind of takes you away from the standard ais presentation if you may and then uh, if you start looking down this does look like uh, you know dysplastic uh, it looks like a dysplastic lumbar spine so the take away here is that don't proceed here without more information so we did ask for a long long lateral standing film and i think it's a it's the giveaway here right so this is that classic presentation of a dysplastic scoliosis i mean dysplastic spondy presenting like a scoliosis and uh, i think the discussion really begins here and maybe i can ask uh, ayush what uh, how you think through this like once you have this scenario this girl did have some uh, pain and some you know some bilateral thigh pain on history which is totally un unusual for an ais and uh, on examination of course she had tight hamstrings and then it was a classic presentation of a high grade spondy what's your thought process here so so, so uh, uh, c is differently high grade and you know the looking at the slip angle see the way the if we, uh, roughly you get, you get an idea so this is like it is more likely to progress as c goes out so all those is pretty okay today you know we say for some things you you have told but the the c is like as c um, uh, c grows c is uh, 13 years old c is likely to progress further because it's a it's a it's the slip angle which will go in and as c grows out uh, c will go it's already like grade 4 c go grade 5 and uh, then the problem start because you know your l5 nerve root which starts getting stretched because of that because because you know it is getting kinked between the l5 uh, l5 and s1 so so it's uh, i think this is the time when you tell them everything although the symptom might not be very very significant today but you need to talk to the patient and you need to counsel them that uh, this needs attention this needs uh, some sort of intervention because 
if the symptom is not significant today, it's likely to be more significant as the patient progresses. Right. Does anyone in the house, Manish, do you, do you see any role of conservative treatment in a high-grade spondy who's a teenager? High-grade uh, dysplastic spondy who's a teenager? Uh, absolutely not, sir. This is, a, as Ayush said, this is a time you explain, give them the prognosis and uh, go straight for surgery. It's one case you don't want to conserve at all. Yeah, uh, many that's... times, many times, patients say that can we wait till we actually have neurological deficit? Uh, the first is actually quite rather good, which is going to be devastating, and there is no reserve. So I think that's a strong point driven home by the faculty that. A high-grade spondy with dysplasia in a teenager has no role for conservative treatment, no matter what. And you've got to hard sell the surgery. It's a very, very different animal compared to high-grade degen listhesis. And of course, completely different from a grade 1 or you know, grade 2 lytic listhesis. Uh, Dr. Agnivesh, can you uh, point out something here that uh, worries you and something here that makes you feel happy? <laughs> Uh, uh, sir, are you talking about the reduction plan? So, so uh, everything, like you're now the uh, surgeon in charge. And then, yeah. you know, there's something that would bring a smile to your face and something that makes you... So, one thing which I uh, am happy about is that this is a postural scoliosis. So, I am not looking at sort of uh, bigger surgery and then wondering what I will be doing at the tail end of the construct. And... Uh, Second, which I see in these x-rays is that probably it seems to be a bit mobile and coming back. So that gives a sign of relief that the if this is uh, reducing in a sort of awake position, it's going to be better when the patient is under GA and positioned. Right. So here, Agnivesh, can I just pick your brains further? That this lady, she actually came from Bangladesh with the scoliosis or the coronal pain deformity as a chief complaint. So, how would you then think through, like, are there situations where you would think of doing the scoliosis before the listhesis or, or together with the listhesis or would you obligatorily do the listhesis before the scoliosis? What is your algorithm? Uh, sir, if clinically I am convinced that this is postural as seen in Adam's test also, probably I would also want to show them a, 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 lying, a, a lying down x-ray to show them that the scoliosis is coming when she is standing and not when she is lying down. So probably once uh, the lower one, the dysplastic part is fixed, then we can have a look at uh, the scoliosis. And uh, I don't uh, think that both need to be done together. The scoliosis seems to be more cosmetic complaint. So that's why parents are more worried about it. But I would think of treating the more evident part first and then taking a call on scoliosis. Ayush, do you have an indication to do scoliosis before the spondy? Or do you have an indication to do scoliosis with the spondy? Uh, you're muted. Sorry. 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 So I don't think the scoli is a result. Of, it's um, it's come. It's a structural curve. It's the looking at whatever we have discussed. So for for all the reasons, I will I will sort of uh, go with the listhesis reduction. And looks it looks pretty uh, there there is like uh, a good chance that that will take care of the school as well because it is coming it is the listhesis which is leading to the to the curve which we are we are seeing so for, for sure I will tackle the listhesis first. Yeah, Vishal, uh, if the pa I hope you're still there. If the patient obviously is going to ask you, will I need the scoli surgery? What are the chances and uh, do you think doing this spondy is going to take away my requirement to do the scoli surgery? What would you, how would you reply? It can go other ways, but majority of them should uh, correct significantly to not warrant a surgery. It is once the spondy is corrected is when you would want to revisit again what is the balance and then take a call. Because always, my majority of them should settle down. Are there any uh, pointers to suggest a scoli that's not going to resolve after the spondy? So, like you said, you do a supine x-ray and see how much is it uh, correcting. Uh, and on our Adam says she's like flat. She's not even kind of little uh, up there. So, this should. A stiff curve would worry me. But I, whatever the case, the uh, uh, sacro-pelvic uh, alignment needs to be restored. The L5-S1 needs to be restored. You do that. See how much is the correction. You can always build up on it if it is required later. So, Ranjit, can I bring you in at this point and can you give us very clear pointers in the two types of scenarios? One is a concurrent scoli with a spondy and one is a spondy that's leading to a scoli and uh, where 
you know, situation where you're likely to need both to be corrected and a situation where there's a high chance that merely doing the spondy is going to take care of the scoli. Yes, Abhay. So, uh, like, uh, like you mentioned, I always believe that a high-grade lysthesis is a different animal. It's a deformative surgery. Not uh, the uh, vis-a-vis -vis the compared one with, uh, with Dr. Vishal extended demonstrative. It's a degenerative surgery. So, associated of high-grade lysthesis with the spawn, with the scoliosis, all of them will not resolve by just doing the lysthesis. See, this is this particular patient is a classical kind of patient whom will resolve once you do the lysthesis. The reason being that they are the smooth, smooth curves with a higher apex, not a lower apex. So, if I forget the lysthesis and take, say, a type 5 lengthy scoli, a type 6 curves, these are the curves in which just by doing the lysthesis, they will not uh, resolve. Those are the ones wherein I would want to do, the, say, you take a lumbar scoli with an apex at L3. So, you will end up, your, your LIV will come to around, say, apex at L2. Your LIV will come to something like L4, L5. Anyway, you're going to do the lysthesis also. Those are the cases. The One of them are the cases where I would do the lysthesis along with the scoliosis, number one. Number two, the lysthesis along with the scoliosis, which I got significant vertebral rotation. These are the ones in which once you do the lysthesis, the curve will not uh, resolve. The yeah, elder patient. Elder patients, again, the one in which you do the lysthesis, the curve will not resolve. Next are the patients in which syndromic patients with lysthesis and scoliosis. These are again the patients wherein I will not, I will not like to stage it. I would like to do both together. This patient which you have shown is a classical one where would I want to just do the lysthesis and observe for the curved result. She's 13 years if I get it right. So there's a very good possibility that the, the, the curve higher up will resolve over time. So thank you for that. So the faculty, I think, uh, echoes that if it's an atypical curve, doesn't fit into the classic curve patterns, if it's a young child and if, uh, you know, the spondy is high grade and there's clear-cut dysplasia, there's a high chance that this one will settle with, uh, uh, though, though, you know, you got to give it at least two years, I mean, at least one year to That's right. assess whether the scoli is settling and don't get jumpy at three months. And you got to reassure the family that you can save her off a very big operation by doing a much smaller, uh, technically smaller operation, though it's a larger operation. That's what we did. And uh, though it looks odd now, because of the lockdown, she's never come back. And this is the only picture that she sent, you know, post-op. And, uh, uh, you know, within three months or whatever, she was already coming in line. And the fact that she's not uh, come back uh, suggests that she's all good and happy. Though she's in communique and she's a medical student, so she, sh you know, she would have picked out if there was a problem. But yeah, I I mean, like, uh, what you rightly mentioned, don't wait them to correct in three months, six months. Two years is the right time. Two years, at least, like you mentioned, I think it's it is a uh, verse of wisdom. You have to wait for at least 18 months, two years for them to align up. And again, once you look at Kitam and follow up, they will not line up the way you want. You will not get a straight spine. She will balance out. She will balance out with a gentle curve higher up and she will balance out. That's it. And Agnivesh, one quick question on the standard question about reduction versus in situ. Uh, can you give us your quick, uh, you know, five pointers where you would want to reduce and five pointers where you can get away with a five or three maybe without a reduction? So, uh, the uh, technical aim of the surgery should be to get it to around grade two because if you keep it uh, more than that, like grade three, then you have less fusion surface which you have to transverse between L5 and S1 for uh, fusion. So, grade two is something which you should aim for to get it safely grade one even better uh, again in lot of these high grade cases uh, we use neuro monitoring so you have to also respect what neuro monitoring is showing because there is a these uh, because of this list is the l5 roots are under tremendous stress when you uh, sort of reduce them so you have to keep on clinically checking the tension of the l5 root also as you are reducing and you also have to uh, sort of keep the neuro monitoring in check we have had uh, heard incidences where everything went well from reduction and while you were doing the last part of compressing the cage, that time the neuromonitoring signals were going off. So you had to accept sort of undo a bit and then compress less and do it. So it's a clinical situation. You should aim for grade two because for in uh, sort of uh, to get a good fusion, to have enough surface, you should try to aim the lordosis at the level, at least bring it to neutral. Not, if not in kyphosis, 
so that your remaining spine can balance out the thing so with these aims you have to take the clinic uh, the surgical decisions and steps into mind this is what i think sir perfect so i think that's the game here and uh, that's the game here and i think we can move on with the next case this was a bit of a googly but uh, i just wanted to show it You're muted, Agnivesh, you're muted. Sorry. So I'm going to proceed with my case. And uh, it's a 53-year-old male, a regular scenario which we see in our OPD, black pain with claudication, progressively worsening, not able to walk beyond a few minutes, has started to get early deficit in L5, tried conservative but no relief and worsening, has been taking some uh, off-the-shelf medications off and on for his pain for a very long time. And... These are the x-rays of the patient. And uh, I, would, I would like to bring in uh, uh, Ayush here and ask him, Ayush, what do you uh, sort of see when you see these x-rays and what are the thought processes going on in your mind? So, uh, Agni, if you see, there is a, uh, like, when you see them, there's a couple of things to consider. Uh, you, of course, uh, you have put in a flex and extension view, which shows that there's some instability which is happening because the angle is getting sort of the, uh, from grade maybe one to two. And uh, um, the, uh, more than that, again, you need to even look at other things like how is the pelvic parameters. Uh, and now we... And because, you know, they do make a difference whether you accept it or not. And uh, so basically this patient is having a... Uh, uh, mobility at L4-5 and uh, and so that is what I can see and that and if you see that the disc height uh, is sort of reduced and further the listesis is adding that stretch on the L4 foramen and that's why you see the deficit which is coming in. So these all things come into picture. It's good to, good to have this x-ray but it's always better to have a full length x-ray uh, when you are doing any sort of instrumentation and believe me even if you're doing a single level. right so uh, this is the mri of the patient so what we see uh, here is uh, in, in interest of time i'm going to just quickly go through this so l45 there is a disc herniation and l34 is also bad these are the axials at l45 and these is the axial at l34 so uh, i want to come here to uh, manish and ask manish looking at this L34, does it alter your plan, what you had thought initially of the X-rays? Yeah, of course, that L34 uh, facet looks a bit... Uh, so, uh, you know, movement as such on dynamic X-rays, the facets are... Uh, so, I will be thinking of two different solutions here. There is a small pro disc at L34 as well. So I go for two-level fusion and not a single-level fusion. Right. Thank you so much, Manish. Nini, sir, would you would you agree agree with the plan or any different thoughts? No, I fully agree because uh, here's a case where you're going to convert a very mobile and loose area into a very stiff area. So you always are worried about walking into the trap of adjacent segment degeneration, even in the normal segment. You already have a red flag on the adjacent segment, and I'm glad. You know, you noticed it and it's a message out to everyone that whenever you're planning a one-level fusion, you have to look at the next segment and the potential chances of it, uh, you know, going wet and mobile soon. And uh, even though the flexion extension did show a lot of movement there, this is a clear-cut red flag for a, you know, for a very hurried uh, ASD coming up. And I would want to preemptively fuse the next one, the next level. So I would go with Manish's plan also. Right. Uh, Dr. Vishal, can I get you in here? Yes, Agnish. Yeah. Uh, uh, what do you think? Uh, what would be your treatment plan? Like two-level fusion, but would you want to do MIS or would you want to do a conventional? Or how would you like to go about it? Why do conventional when you can do both of it MIS? So the option here, like I agree with uh, Ayusha that you need to do a full-length X-ray. In addition, I also do a sitting X-ray, sitting slouched X-ray to unmask any because that's the maximum stress position of the back. 
and if you ask them to relax sometimes very mild instabilities get unmasked so uh, things uh, that you would want to is already got an adjacent level which is bad so your restoring the lordosis is very important so whichever way you do, you do it open or mis there has to be a good adequate size cage in the front it ideally should be a lordotic or an anatomical cage uh, i would put it at 3 4 i would put a lordotic cage at 4 5 and i have a nice uh, lordos rod, uh, rod on which we compress to get the lordosis back decompression fusion uh, there are some who prefer open and there are some i would do only mis in fact we did something similar today can can i have a counter argument to things yeah please go ahead please go ahead yeah so 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 if you see that why the segment went into ast because there was a listesis and there was a you know the there there must be some mismatch which which went to the stress went to the l34 so if you restore that uh, the 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 whole harmony of the lumbar segment the chances that it will degenerate further no one can predict the chances are less so why do it today when you can and there are many ways to do it you can ast is and no one can predict how much the ast will go but maybe maybe if if you give me this case i will make sure that i can restore the Well, the, the lumbar parameters perfectly with one level L45, and wait for the ST to see how it goes. And if it degenerates to tomorrow, maybe after two years, four years, whatever, then I am going to tackle it. Why do something which which can be with this? We all know the lumbar spine, the degeneration is a process. It doesn't happen in one day. And to predict so, something uh, that will happen tomorrow, we we cannot. In an ideal world, I shall just want to come in. Uh, in an ideal world, it's a perfect solution to do only what is required at that time. but there is also a practical world where you got to exist so in a practical world you would do two levels in an ideal world or if you were say in germany france or singapore uh, or uh, sorry not say uh, england where the government is paying you would do one level at a time but where you are in a private practice and if you don't fix this there are a couple of things that we need to if he comes back it's going to be blamed on you for not picking up when obviously a uh, full facet sign where there is instability if you have a full facet i'll be more worried about a full facet than a degenerated disc because a full facet is an effused facet which is an unstable situation uh, other thing is your colleagues are going to rain on your parade saying yaar ye to pehle se aisa tha isko kyun pehle fix nahi kiya this is what happens in real life so uh, you have to be idealistic yes but you have to uh, temper it with the practicality so uh, i mean in a situation of medical colleges and uh, you could be a uh, government or hospitals you can be doing this but in private practice i would not advise you to just do l4 5 and let it be because it can be very unforgiving when people come when there was a normal segment above and they come after 10 years saying 10 saal pehle aapne kiya tha ab ye dusra kharab ho gaya kya gad pad raha so even when you do adjacent levels in a normal segment are something that people are unhappy with in private practice so when in an obviously effused facet when you leave it in private practice you are going to be in trouble that's a uh, practical advice of course idealism and practicality have no uh, how to say friendship in them yeah, yeah i agree with you so uh, for so exactly for my so i have a i, know, I yeah, yeah go ahead please yeah. yeah manish please go ahead i have a slight disagreement on this there is no difference in private practice or government practice the aim is to give one surgery to the patient and he should not come back forever So I I agree. I agree to disagree. You, there's no one surgery to any patients if you go to a long term follow. No, <laughs> no. I, I use uh, what they are trying to say, na. That we need to at least try to give a reasonable amount of pain free time. What we are trying to say is we need to give at least some reasonable amount of pain free time. So uh, Vishal is talking about ten years down the line, which is actually quite impractical. Uh, but at least we should not come back in six months' time saying that. He's got this problem again, which where where there is a high likelihood in six months or one year's time he may come back. Uh, I actually want to go away from the discussion. I want to ask Vishal one question. Uh, in this case, where we are now fixing two levels, uh, and uh, we are already worried about ASD at L3 core. Now, if you fix two levels, there is a very high chance that the patient is going to start getting ASD at the level above, and. Uh, uh it, you know keeping this in mind i mean it may happen in 2 years 3 years 5 years we don't know but keeping that in mind would it be beneficial to do it open so that you can do a 
uh, prophylactic decompression of the level above is that something that you would consider so i uh, see uh, that this will take two three answers to answer everything uh, adjacent level if it comes at 2 3 if you are fixed to like 3 4 and 4 5 2 3 is very like, this is something that abhay actually spoke and i realized the sa- uh, sanity of his advice you will be more worried about the l5 s1 coming back because that's where all the movement is going to go l2 3 hardly has any mobility if it does come the more uh, majority of them will come back if you have not uh, given a proper lordosis uh if you do mis there's no reason why you can't just do the next level mis all you need to do is to remove the screw from the proximal most side disengage the rod and dock your tube and uh, go ahead with that so uh, we have done revisions of previously mis cases and yes it's a little different than doing it routinely but then all revisions even open they're equally bad to do uh doing a prophylactic decompression i wouldn't because if i have to go to an adjacent level i would at least prefer that one level to be virgin and not messed around with so i hope that answers your question other thing is see i used as a lot of them olif is another alternative at this level you can go laterally for that one level and put a lateral plate and that should also help you in restoring uh, restoring your balance so these, these are the options that are available i would worry about l5 s1 the more than the l23 because l5 s1 is where the maximum movement will be there because 4 5 and 3 4 are blocked Talking about the upper, upper level, I think Nene sir has a good experience with dynamic system and the mobile systems. So maybe that is a good option in this case also. So Abhay sir, would you would you want to give your experience sir, yeah. about the uh, the fixation with a stiff rod and a, a sort of? Yeah, a I think this rod. is a good case for that uh, transition rod where there's a mobile, you know, a soft landing as they say. no this is absolutely speculative with no uh, you know though we we have good results so what we've done it's very arbitrary and you know lopsided because we don't have a collateral comparison no one in the world has a collateral comparison it's just that i i put my flag out there and say i do these but uh, the idea being that there's always a segment adjacent to the adjacent level so the minute i fuse for 3 4 and 4 5 i'm always lining up for a 2 3 adjacent segment degeneration and um, you know it is well known the more you fuse the more likely the asd chances of asd the longer your fusion construct so one of the hypotheses is uh, you know you do a soft landing which is uh, you know you either preemptively do a soft fusion above or do a spacer or something like that so i think this case which is asymptomatic for 3 4 which is a speculative uh, you know concept of having an asd may be a good idea to do a um you know a rod below and a cable above but it's prohibitively expensive so you got to worry about that with no good data to prove it right thank you so much so uh, can i have dr ranjit here and ask him that uh, patient comes to you and says that doctor you want i you just make me all right i don't understand this olif tlif mis tlif and this uh, transition rod system and all of this so how how are you going to look at this mri and how you will you plan this treatment yeah uh, uh to answer that for me any listhesis is a spinopelvic uh, harmony or disharmony like what dr ayush mentioned i i necessarily don't get a full length x-ray done for all my listhesis but any single level fusion i do i make sure that there is spinopelvic balance that's point number 1 i the listhesis is quite obvious we know that this patient has got back and leg pain that means there is instability with foramen stenosis the leg pain is because of foramen stenosis and the disc it's very clear that this has to be released now comes the question of long term results uh, i totally agree with ayush what really matters in the long term is trying to restore the sagittal balance back that is the only one thing which we can do as surgeons to ensure that the adjacent segment level decreases not stop second is surgical techniques like preserving the face sets Uh, less damage to the facet capsule which is easily done with the so called minimally invasive techniques in which we don't damage the midline now the question between doing olif tlif uh, open tlif for the uh, transition or etc is purely your decision as to what works in your hands i am yet to get a patient to be convinced like what dr abhay mentioned that i tell him that i'll do a soft landing to you and then le- let us see what happens in future people who can pay so much for me ask me 10 questions doctor you are very sure that you can avoid a fusion there i said no so they are not uh, you know they don't buy the surgery now 
to do between olive and mist lift in this case in my hands i will opt for an mist lift because this is a patient where i have to directly decompress the foramen i cannot just put in my olive cages and put the screws and expect the foramen to decompress so in this case i will strictly not opt for a olive this is a tele for me and in my hands i will do a two level mist lift because i am really worried about the so that upper face upper uh, uh, full facet which if the patient says that fine uh, you know i am willing to take a chance i will do one level but if you ask me i am happy doing two levels and time to risk this is not a imbalanced spine so you can fairly the most important thing is look down into the sacrum you have a fallen sacrum be very careful don't try it because a fallen sacrum means increased lumbar lordosis your surgery should not decrease the lordosis be very careful about that you have vertical sacrum don't increase the lordosis so every patient balance that you have to measure you would do it your choice open mis it's your technique you this purely your choice but i will ensure that that's what i do i do intra uh, measurement and see that i've got my uh, balance back so this patient for me is a two level mis telif i will openly really decompress the uh, uh, 4 five and also do 3 4 right thank you so much uh just just a question to the panel is that um, uh, uh, do you regularly do bone densities before uh, fusing the patients or before planning the surgeries what is the protocol among the faculty can i ask uh, dr neeni to begin with not for a young patient i would not do it but for an uh, uh, clinically a relevant situation like a you know 10 year post when there was a lady or someone who's had fractures or bad looking x rays i probably will uh, dr abey is it will it affect your surgery not quite actually oh, yeah you let me tell you the clinical outcome because uh, a lot of people yeah a lot of people come with significant back pain related to the osteoporosis like a you know 75 year old lady you would want to concurrently treat the osteoporosis yeah, yeah but it will not probably change your surgical plan Absolutely. right say you do a dexa and there is a bone mineral content of less than 50 will you change your surgical plan no no absolutely not can i say something yeah i just please go ahead yeah so so any patient more than 50 we get a dexa if planning for mis fusion any dexa which is minus 3.5 and above i wait i put them on teriparatide and demizumab for 3 weeks don't ask me 3 weeks because that is what we have done and we have come we just what we have done and i'm i'm i yet to you know go back and say how it has worked or not but we have seen that uh, the so 3 weeks is what we do and then only we take them for mis not for open uh for because mis screw you rely more on like you don't uh you, because it is more of the purchase and everything i think 3 weeks in 3 weeks will your bone density improve so much that no, no it bone... doesn't improve it doesn't improve on dexa but clinically that is what that uh, that's why i told you we have to go back and see our own things but we do that and what we have seen that the chances of failures have decreased that is what i can tell but you know it we we are going through the whole series and comparing the data Three weeks is an arbitrary number. The reason is you uh, know yeah, the, the literature support is three months. Literature yeah. support three months of uh, bone. We know the remodeling of the bone and the orthopedic that the three weeks is the time a bone remodels, and that is how. So, uh, so that is how it has been our protocol. Minus dexa, more than minus two point. And something it's on a uh, lateral dexa or a standard AP dexa. No, uh, like we get the whole body dexa, and you know, I know dexa can be debated. You know, there is so, ways and all uh, those. So we have gone yeah. over. Uh, we uh, no more do. We don't look at the AP dexa. We look at the lateral dexa because yeah. all these elderly have yeah. lost their fights. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, I agree with. AP dexa is totally misled. So we look at the lateral dexa, and all treatment based on lateral dexa. And now I after the pa- a paper from. Uh, 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 um, Uh, Kulkarni et al. I am just thinking. U C T. Yeah, should we look at U C T now and not just? Yeah, that. So it, there is a whole lot of debate going there. But this is so what one of the things. Sanjeev, yeah. what you can do is look at the lowest score. Usually, if there is a very high density in the spine, I would look at the femoral neck. I would look at the distal and radius, which would be the true representation. And most of them, even uh, like sometimes you get dexa of minus one in the spine uh-huh. and minus three point five in the distal and radius, and you operate, and then you find the bone is all flimsy. So if uh, my take is in one or level, or I wouldn't look at the dexa much. I would definitely restore the vitamin D and uh, calcium uh, balance of the patient, but more than two levels or in degenerative scoliosis 
I would want the patient's uh, bone uh, to be augmented. We would give three to six months of uh, teriparatide before we venture into a surgical correction. Because and other thing is beyond two levels, if the uh, score is beyond minus two, you would want to avoid percutaneous screw fixation because in an open surgery, you have, uh, this is something that I always uh, tell, this is what Neelan told us once, in an open surgery, the rod goes to the screw. In an MIS surgery, the screw comes to the rod. So in one level, it won't matter because you can easily settle the rod. Two levels, it will take some amount of uh, uh, moving it around, but you will still be able to get it. But if it is three plus levels, you should not do it in a grossly osteoporotic patient because some of your screws are going to get plucked up. And that plucked screw is a disaster in mating. So uh, in, in a very, very osteoporotic patient, more than two levels, you'd rather be doing an open surgery than an MIS surgery. Right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, in uh, in my center, what we have been doing is above 50, we regularly do DEXA and we have got surprises in patients in which we never expected. It has helped us to sort of uh, change our plan or uh, as uh, Dr. Ayush said, I don't, if it's an elective surgery, I would wait for three months. If it's a non-elective surgery, then probably it needs to be done. So this patient turned out to be osteoporotic, probably those off the shelf medications he was taking was not sort of from some uh, sort of uh, Ayurvedic Babaji or something and most likely must be containing steroids. So his DEXA was minus 3.5. And uh, in view of deficit, we plan to go ahead with the surgery. I am not uh, comfortable with the uh, sort of uh, uh, this uh, MIS in uh, these type of uh, situations with a lot of DEXA. So I did a uh, L45 T lift with a uh, sort of a soft type of a PLF, which uh, in my this thing is a more soft than a T lift scenario. Uh, but uh, the story doesn't end here. Uh, if we have five minutes, we can go ahead. So the patient had a fall. He fell down twice and he came back with a real the cage sort of sinking into the uh, uh, L5 body and this L5 screw projecting forward. Uh, he was started on teriparatide as it is post-operatively, but this was something uh, he was having and the pain was uh, sort of not settling. This is one month after the teriparatide and his pain is worsening and he's having severe instability pain. The x-rays are showing uh, the persistent listesis. The screw has moved forward there is some attempt for bone fusion, but there is still a lot of vacuum around. So, which means that it has not fused it. So, and these are big halos around the L5 screw. So, in this situation, can I ask Dr. Nene that uh, how to salvage the situation? So, I would still put my money on medical treatment here and I've done it in the past. And the only thing is that uh, I'm not sure if osteoporosis is a cause or aseptic discitis. I've got a handful of cases which have uh, reacted to the cage. And, uh, you know, especially uh, peak cages have this propensity of causing inflammatory changes in the end plates, which cause the end plates to eat up. And it's non-infective discitis, which actually settles just like that. And uh, I would, of course, put my money on teriparatide here, but I don't... And not I, even not even a discitis, it is the reaction to the peak. Yeah, reaction. So, up to, so when you have more than 2 millimeter of uh, widening, progressive in your CTs or X-rays, that's when you think it is loose. Yeah. So, literally, so, up to 18 so yeah, months... This, this, this was not one of the situations. Uh, this was clearly a loosening because he had a fall and the screws moved forward. So there was an unstable situation at the L45. And I'm sure he was very, very symptomatic. So I'm sure the radiology is not lying here. All I'm saying is that it's uh, a combination of weak bones and inflammatory reactive, uh, uh, in, you know, uh, discitis into inverted commas. I would just back myself with NSAIDs and uh, teriparatide and wait. Right. So, uh, I, uh, Dr. Ayush, your, your take on the yeah, so, so, you know, maybe give everything, try everything, give denosumab, give dairy fat, wait and watch. You know, you don't want to burn yourself again. So, you know, most of them will settle this way or that way. And uh, and if not, then then you bring the, bring the big guns out. So that is how I will go. So um, uh, let me ask Vishal, sir. Vishal, sir, the patient is not settling, done everything. He's having radicular pain again very much uh, symptomatic, not able to walk up to washroom also, getting severe instability pain. So I think the problem lies in the inferior uh, pressure of the L5 screws. 
So they are, I think if you go back to the x-rays, uh, have you done a standing x-ray of this gentleman? Yeah. This, okay. So this phi screw uh, the, is actually just, uh, there is an arc over the, it is just below the inferior margin of the pedicle. So every time he's going to load bear, I think the L5 root must be getting irritated. Apart from uh, the four that is getting caught because now you have an active instability at the four five with the L5 screw losing its purchase. Uh, here, if the pain is still there, we by waiting it out, I don't think we're doing uh, justice to the patient. This I would go in, try to see if I can put in a cemented screw at L5, but I'm sure here you will have to do a tailor a level below and put in sacral screws to get better purchase to hold the construct together in the long run sooner better but this is not going to settle if that l5 screw is loose that's the foundation of your fixation if the foundation is loose you might have a very solid uh, building above it's going to fall that's what is happening here right so uh manish uh any any uh, inputs anything from your side yeah, I agree with uh, Vishal, sir. Is you try to conserve as much as you can, probably add denosumab, as I just said, and wait and watch. But that halo is too big, the screw is completely dangling, literally dangling there. So it's it's a clinical call, basically. Right. So unfortunately, this patient was not settling, and uh, I had to revise him. I changed the L5 screws to a shorter one, but uh, I had to go to pelvis to stabilize him because the L5 screws were grossly loose. So I had to retract them, put shorter screws. And I did sacrum and uh, S2LR iliac fixation to salvage the situation. It's around six months now. The patient is doing fine. And I hope the teriparatide is working. And I'm waiting for his x-rays. He's not from India, but he's been sending regular messages that he's been doing well now. So one question here, Agnivesh. Yeah. You left the base, the L5 S1 without a T lift. Do you routinely do that in such a long construct? Uh, normally, I would not do it, sir, but I was uh, not comfortable putting another cage and taking out that facet because I was not worried about that L5 S1 fusion here. What I was more worried about is to protect my L45 to get that fusion over here. So, because I had sort of uh, once bitten, twice shy situation, so I did not want to put another cage in L5 S1 and have that hallowing around and then creating another segment, which I would not have anything to salvage. You actually committed all your uh, cars here on a sacro-pelvic fixation. But yeah. the sacro-pelvic fixation, the whole thing is sitting on the sacrum. And if you don't have a 360 degree fusion there, uh, there is a chance that it may fail. I'm not saying it will. Well, uh, Michelle, can I come in here? Can I come in here? Yeah, well, so so mm -hmm. uh, there are three ways to salvage the situation. Number one, if you have put a bicortical, a tricortical S1 screw like what he has done, and you have protected that with a two sacral screw, you need not do an interbody at 5S1. So the three ways to prevent an S1 screw overload is number one is a tricortical S1 screw. Number two is a tricortical S1 screw with an interbody at L5S1. Number three is a tricortical S1 screw with a S2 AI. So in this case, Agni has gone and taken the option. I don't think it will fail. Plus, he has gone up. So um, I think it's going to heal. He had a loose screw. It was not a biology failure. It was a biology and a mechanical failure. He has tried to solve it with the mechanical failure solution as well as biological solution. So all cases of, see, say you have a six millimeter L5S1 space on your pre-op X-ray. You're not going to jack it up and open up and put a larger screw there to just to make sure you get a uh, you know interbody there. So less than six millimeter literature says that you can fair, fair, fair enough, put interbody graft if possible, go to tricortical S1 or protect them with a S2AI. Absolutely so fair. Rajiv, uh, I, I agree with what you're saying, but here it's a revision scenario. You don't want to come back again for anything at the he's base. He's not going to come back. I mean, I can fairly say I mean, he's going to heal. I, I, don't, but done, I uh, would buy my insurance by doing an interbody. Everybody does it separate uh, as the way they are comfortable. But in my hands, I would do the base always has to be fused through uh, circumferentially. Uh, this will work. I hope it does work for uh, good of the patient. But uh, that's buying an extra insurance. You don't want to put in a cage. You do a P-lift approach, preserve the facets, put in a large amount of graft in there. That also works. Yeah, I think you find out why was your screw used? 
was whether an infection no, i i sent the scrapings and all that for the histopath and cultures they did not uh, grow any organism so there was no infection at least over there it's like what I did not go in into the disc happened. and curate anything out from there yeah you have left your case there it's quite obvious you yeah, just left yeah, there yeah. you try to keep it there and uh, salvage the whole construct yeah, because fair. at least in ct i was uh, seeing that there is some bone attempt formation through the cage and around Definitely. it you should never yeah. go and disturb that let the biology work there perfectly done perfect salvage so uh, with that uh, i would close the case but uh, for the viewers i would request them to block the dates for the bss con it's going to be very exciting conference from 14 to 16th of october 2022 and there are very very good uh, pre conference uh, workshops happening post conference workshop happening on uh, hands on caregiver course for the cervical spine and a spine tumor course so please register yourselves and be a part of this academic feast uh, thank you so much so i will stop the screen share so uh, thank you so much guys for uh, giving this uh, opportunity to us to collaborate and have this webinar thank you karthik so much for uh, all what you have done the flyers and all of that and it was a pleasure to be i would like to thank uh, abhin ne sir for being part taking time out being part of this i'd like to thank uh, dr vishal sir for uh, giving that excellent talk with a video demonstration dr ranjit sir joining all the way from uh, trivandrum and uh, giving his valuable insights and ayush and manish very very close friends dear friends but excellent spine surgeons and masters in their own field so thank you so much from my side if there are no more uh, questions then i will hand it over back to dr satyam thank you thanks thanks uh, nivesh uh, again i'll not take much time thank you to all the faculty for being here and giving an excellent uh, uh, session uh, it was a uh, very good uh, discussion uh, and uh, i hope to see you all soon uh, and uh, ranjit uh, i'll see you at bss con for sure, huh? sure. yeah thank you everybody good night thank you bye good night bye good night thank you good night thank you bss all the opportunity to you bye vishal bye abhi bye 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 guys